Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> Boy, can we hear you, Emory. <laughs> that was loud. We're going to turn there it we go. Hang tight, buddy. We're there almost... We're going to begin in a moment. We're waiting to get a quorum of 12, and we are No problem. There. I was almost thinking Georgia on my mind, and I had to <laughs> unmute myself. Okay, we have Representative McLeod. Welcome. That gives us what number? We're going to start promptly at three. We Thank have you. we have a three thirty committee meeting with Game Fish and Parks. I know myself and several other members, but um, I do want to make sure as we're waiting, everybody's aware we we wanted to hear from HFRD because we do have some Representative Cannon is on. Okay, so we have a quorum. All right, you ready? Yep. Okay, can everyone hear me? remotely yes sir yes okay thank you wonderful um i just wanted to uh let y'all know i was just saying that we have uh we will keep this short and sweet this is primarily organizational um although we will be voting on our rules again for uh this term and but we do have uh, a presentation uh, from the department of community health to speak about the healthcare facility regulation division because we do have some bills uh, that appear to be coming this year that will relate to uh, the regulation of, of facilities and some of the issues related to facilities, whether they're skilled nursing facilities or um, uh, assisted living facilities, personal care homes, home care, all of these entities that are regulated by HFRD. So I thought that would be beneficial. So let's begin by just welcoming, I do wanna say this before we begin, we have some new members and I know this is uh, strange times and not everybody is here, but I do see in the room, we have Representative McLaurin is here, uh, Mac <laughs> McDonald is here <laughs> with us. Welcome to the committee. Uh, represent uh, Representative um, Rebecca Mitchell is on uh, the call, is that correct? Representative Mitchell? Are you there? Yes, I'm on the call. I don't know if you can hear me. Hello? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, can you uh, hear me? Yes, I am here. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, so Liz, welcome, and we, we, we're so happy to have you a member of this board. And um, any other new member? Yes, Representative Byrd, who I thought wasn't going to make it. Representative Charlize Byrd is with us today as well. New member, welcome uh, to this committee. Okay, uh, very good, and, uh, and, and we do have, oh, Representative Gamble is not new, but new to this committee, so thank you, Representative, for being here. We appreciate you, and um, uh, Deputy Commissioner Hood, uh, Tara, is, is, is he prepared to speak at this time? Can you hear me, Mr. Hood, with the department? Um, hi, Chairman. Um, this is Caitlin Ward. Um, I am the legislative liaison for the department. Um, I'm going to go first, and then I'm going to hand it over uh, to uh, Joe to finish up our presentation. Okay. All right. Well, if you'll hang tight one moment, I wanted uh, we will hand it over to you in just a moment. I wanted to make sure that y'all were on and able to hear us, and the technology was working. So very good. So yes, let's sir. let's do this first. Oh, hey, Joe. See you now. Um, all right, let's begin, uh, now that we've welcomed our new members, let's begin, uh, and we have a quorum uh, that is confirmed, let's begin by adopting our rules. All of our rules, uh, our rules were sent out to all of our members, I should say, by Ms. Tara. Everyone has those. Um, these are uh, absolutely consistent with the rules from the last term. So, do I have a motion to accept these rules as presented? Okay, have a second, we got that. Okay, all in favor? Okay. I have a discussion on the rules. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, who was that, please? Sorry, it was Representative Cannon. 
I wanted to see if there was discussion. Uh, do we need to have any discussion? Would like to ask for one. Sure, uh, go ahead. Representative Wynn. Oh, that was Representative Cannon? Yeah. Okay, I'm having a difficult time hearing. Go ahead, Representative Cannon. I just wanted to see about the quorum. Uh, the quorum is six. I think there are about 23 members on the committee. I wanted to discuss perhaps a different number of a quorum, perhaps 10. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Representative Cannon. Mr. Chair, would we be able to offer that as an amendment? This is Representative Wynn, just to increase the quorum from six to 10. Six to 10. Okay. Any further discussion? It's been, oh, hold, hold on one second. We're trying to get this technology. Go ahead, Representative LaHood. Uh, yes. Okay, so last year we agreed to six. Is there a, um, is there a reason that the two that made the uh, recommendation to go to 10 can give us? Uh, I can't answer that question. <coughs> I will tell you that we had this debate last term and uh, historically it had been set at six and actually it was Chairman Benton, I believe it was lower at one point in time. Is that correct? Uh, it was five, yes. It was five. A quorum had been five. Um, my recollection is we raised it to six last term. And so I think, um, you know, I think we've thoroughly discussed this previously. So, all right. Any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, um, yes, this sir. is Emory, Representative Dunahoo. And some of us are on nine and 10 committees. So I have three meetings at 3.30. This one at three, I've already had four today. So I try to take this seriously, but I think six is better because there are a lot of us that are on nine and 10 committees. Just for that suggestion. Yes, sir. Thank you, Representative. I understand that well. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, we have a we have a motion, we have a second. All in favor of the motion, say aye. Okay, all opposed? All opposed? Aye. We have an, we have an opposed? Okay, Tara's trying to keep record, it's a little difficult with the technology, but it sounds like all are in favor, is that correct? Okay. All right, so the rules are adopted um, as presented. Okay, um, now I'm real excited. I, I alluded earlier, but a couple of folks have walked in since then to the fact that we have had some discussions um, uh, with uh, several members about some bills that would um, relate to different types of facilities. And of course we saw that um, in a particular bill last term that uh, in last session that went through a different uh, committee in that particular case. But um, I thought it would be helpful, as it appears we'll have some bills that relate to some of the different entities that are regulated by the Healthcare Facility Regulation Division in Georgia, which is a division of the Department of Community Health, to have them present to everybody today, especially for new members to help them learn um, about uh, this very important uh, department, very important division, that really uh, protects the most vulnerable people in our society, the frail, the aged, uh, you know, uh, children, uh, the disabled, individuals with developmental disabilities, um, uh, community living arrangements, all of these entities regulated by this division. And I thought it would be helpful for uh, everyone to understand their role uh, because uh, oftentimes uh, as a new member, it's difficult to learn uh, what the roles are for all the different different uh, pieces of the bureaucracy. And so, uh, Mr. Hood, we will now hand it over to you. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, Caitlin's gonna go for, I apologize. Okay, Caitlin, the floor is yours. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Caitlin Ward, and I am the legislative liaison to the Department of Community Health. DCA is an agency with a staff of about 700 people and a budget of over $16 billion. Our team is led by Commissioner Frank Barry. DCH is a regulatory compliance and finance agency with several major programs that fall under our purview. The Medical Assistance Plans Division includes both the Medicaid and Peach Care for Kids programs. Under these two programs, over 2 million Georgians receive their health care coverage. Medical Assistance Plans is currently working on the implementation of two major initiatives, the Patients First Act and the extension of postpartum coverage for pregnant women. Georgia Pathways implementation is set, is set for July 1 and Georgia Access for Plan Year um, 2022. The State Health Benefit Plan is the state-run health insurance program for active and retired state employees, public school teachers and administrators, and their non-certified staff. SHBP currently covers over 650,000 lives. The Office of Health Planning administers the statewide Certificate of Need program. This program, this program reviews healthcare facility applications and is intended to identify community needs, control costs, and guarantee access to healthcare services. DCH also has a satellite office in Cordell, Georgia, that houses the State Office of Rural Health. This office works to improve access to healthcare in rural and underserved parts of the state. Finally, our Healthcare Facility Regulations Division issues licenses and provides oversight to healthcare facilities throughout the state. Most of the bills impacting the department that come through your committee will be related to the work of this division. I will now hand it over to Joe Hood to provide additional detail about the work of this division. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and committee members. Uh, my name is Joe Hood. I'm uh, the Chief Compliance and Technology Officer for the Georgia Department of Community Health. And I primarily work with three divisions within the Department of Community Health on behalf of the Commissioner's Office, on behalf of Frank Berry. And those are the Office of Information Technology, the Office of Inspector General, and the Health Facility Regulation Division. And I liaison with each of them um, for on behalf of the commissioner's office for efforts that we have. So we're going to detail about the health facility regulation division that's run by our executive director, Melanie Simon, and it is structured to provide the regulation portion that Caitlin referenced. Primarily, the, um, the health facility regulation division has three major component parts. It licenses healthcare facilities throughout the state of Georgia. It surveys um, those facilities on an initial and periodic basis, and then it provides complaint investigation, intake, triage, and investigation on a variety of, uh, of the facilities that come to the division. So what we've done is we've prepared a PowerPoint, which to my understanding has been distributed, and given the limited time, I didn't want to go over the PowerPoint slides individually, what I wanted to do was just be, give an overview and then address any questions that you may have. And then, of course, if you have future questions, we'd be happy to, uh, to address those individually or in a, in a separate committee meeting as the chairman sees fit. But basically, as I alluded to, that there are three major components. The first is licensure. So the healthcare facility division would initially license any facility that would come forward, and then they have a continuous uh, renewal of that as as that licensure continues year to year. Um, but there will be an initial survey for any facility that would apply. For example, right now at the end of the year, there was, a, there was the drug abuse and treatment education um, applications that came forward for narcotic treatment programs that they're working forward on licensure. And they would, the, the division will review all aspects of that licensure and then they'll do what's known as an initial survey. They'll schedule and come out and review the facility that's in place to make sure it's compliant with all parts of the application. And then as part of that licensure, they'll go through all aspects and then they'll give opportunity for corrective action if, if they see fit. Um, so there are, as you can imagine, there are a large number of uh, 
healthcare facilities, as the chairman alluded to. Our division covers every aspect of, of any licensure that you can probably think of as it relates to healthcare, from personal care homes to drug treatment education programs to narcotic treatment programs to nursing homes, all the way through hospitals. Um, they are divided upon our oversight, depending upon whether there's federal or state oversight. And our division is structured in that manner. We have a state side and a federal side for oversight. And that sort of leads me into the surveys, which is the next major component. So the surveys that occur are either based upon state survey and state statute, which is set forth. And in the, in the PowerPoint, there's uh, examples of what falls on the state side and what falls on the federal side. And those state surveys, they, they are structured to, to accomplish the state statute oversight that's required as compared to the federal oversight, which is in almost all instances much more complex and, and has a lot more um, guidelines and restrictions and regulations that accompany it. The, most, the largest um, aspect is long-term care in the healthcare facility, which is the nursing homes. It is um, a federal agreement that we have with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, and it's where we spend most of our time and have most of the funding and staff that are dedicated due to the complexity of the nursing homes and the requirements of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid that are related to that funding. Lastly, we have complaints and the department and the division is responsible for intake of all complaints related to healthcare facilities. And they have a triage team, which would go through and evaluate the complexity of that complaint and what the likelihood of harm is to the residents or to the, to the folks who are served through the particular licensure for whatever the complaint may be. And then they investigate that complaint and they attempt to substantiate or not, or not, or not substantiate the complaint. And if there's a substantiated complaint, they work on a corrective action plan that is then developed and put forward to get that service and that entity back to a place where um, the harm is removed and we have a corrective action plan that's approved and, and you know, ultimately services are restored to a safe place. That's basically the three major areas. I didn't want to go into a lot of detail on any one particular item. That's, that's why we had done the PowerPoint separately, but I'm happy to answer any questions or to go to any, any additional venue that, that the chairman will like or that other members have questions on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hood, and uh, again, I, we appreciate very much the good information that, uh, that you provided. I think that'll be helpful to all the members. I would tell you, uh, I do have one question for you, but I first want to tell you that how much we appreciate uh, the, the, uh, the entire department, but especially the folks at HFRD, um, um, you, the phenomenal people there that I've worked with for many years and that really are dedicated to protecting uh, Georgia's most vulnerable and um and 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 especially as, as in these times of covid i know it's been very difficult for them to do that to do that job i would ask you very quickly if you could just briefly tell all of our members um uh, about that um, obviously our skilled nursing facilities have been ground zero for this uh this terrible virus can you speak to some of the challenges obviously that the department has had and the division has had with regulating facilities uh, during COVID and how you, how you feel like um, uh, that may be trending now. Certainly, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to do that. And thank you for the kind words. Uh, that team is doing a, a, a great job and they're very dedicated, uh, the survey team. When COVID hit, um, CMS basically suspended all of the regular surveys that we would do. We do periodic surveys in normal times which really equates to, to in less than 15 months, a survey team of four would go out and do a survey of a nursing home over basically a week's time to, uh, to renew and make sure that there are not any problems. And that's unrelated to complaints. And then typically they would, if there were complaints pending, they would review those and do corrective action as necessary during that time frame. In COVID, that was not, um, you know, not the focus. And what we changed to was surveyors reaching out individually to nursing homes and assisted living and documenting 
COVID activity and resource issues within those homes for a period of time. And then we transitioned, CMS transitioned, and they began to require what we call focus infection surveys that are required. And that's where we are today. And they require that if uh, given guidance by, that they set, they send a list each week to, um, to the division to go out and, and do focus infection surveys, which is a, a reduced survey, you know, less than two days typically um, with, with one to two surveyors that will go in and look to see if, um, if COVID precautions and protocols are being performed appropriately. Some of our challenges in this regard have been staffing. Yeah. Apologize, the light went out there. <laughs> the, so we've, we've had staffing challenges throughout um, because we have to have nurses on these survey teams that yeah. have the subject matter expertise in order to accomplish this. Uh, as you might imagine, they're reviewing nurses and, and being critical of nursing protocols in nursing homes. So we've always had that challenge because the state, you know, is not paying what the scale is for the nursing homes, particularly in metro areas. Yeah. <coughs> 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 Apologize there. <coughs> so we've had a a strong contracting component to the health facility regulation division. And presently we have contractors on hand who are supplementing and doing the focus infection surveys. And those are, that's our biggest challenge right now. And you may see uh, in the budget proposals to further those contracts to bring those forward so that we'll have enough staff support to continue on through COVID and into the next year. We've also presented staffing strategies to recruit and retain staff in particularly in metro areas north of Macon that you may see in, in the budget discussions that are forthcoming. Those are the real challenges, particularly with COVID. <clears throat> we had had many surveyors who were retired nurses or retired folks who are at risk for COVID. And you can understand the staffing challenges that occur and trying to replace them in the field. They've been very diligent in doing the work and we've got, got them back to where it's appropriate doing those surveys and being supplemented with the contractors. But as we move forward, I think staffing is gonna be our biggest challenge. And what we're trying to do is to do a regional recruitment and retention of staff so that there's not a travel component that is as great as we've had in the past, Mr. Chairman. I know you're familiar. We, we've traditionally, we've had nurses from South Georgia that we've recruited. They end up have to go all the way up to North Georgia, and that's that's caused some you know some challenges for us. We're hoping to overcome that in the future in our in a recruiting and retention policy on a regional basis. But that that continues to be the biggest challenge in HFRD. Thank you, sir. That was uh, and as you know, I'm very supportive of making sure we need to make sure that our state departments are keeping the best and the brightest, uh, so that we can not only hire but retain folks. Uh, the best, as the, like I alluded to, some of the best that you have there at HFRD. So thank you, and, and I was uh, glad to support those efforts with the contract uh, support in health appropriations this year. We do have a question from Representative McLeod. Uh, Representative McLeod, the floor is yours. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hood. Um, so when you talk about corrective action, um, root cause plays a part in how you make a corrective action. So you talk about resource, resources being limited, and I'm concerned about that because, again, when we do find a problem uh, and they don't have the resources to actually correct the problem at a root, at the root uh, um, um, part of it, that is concerning for me. But I also wanted to ask you, what is your opinion in expanding Medicaid um, to help in this kind of a situation so that we get these uh, facilities actually being able to impact um, any issues that come their way uh, and, 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 for the, and for the folks that are, 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 are needing that help. 
Okay, so the, the expansion of Medicaid is a policy question. That, that is really beyond my scope. Um, it, it, it doesn't, in, I will speak to it, that doesn't, the funding source doesn't relate to how we would respond to, uh, to a complaint investigation. You know, we have private pay and we have uh, Medicaid paid services, and we're going to respond to a complaint investigation based upon its severity level. So I do want to make sure that everyone's clear on that. So there is a severity scale, and we have very qualified staff that go through through testing, uh, depending upon the facility they're responding to, and they're going to rate that. And if it's if it rises to what we call an immediate jeopardy, we are going to give that immediate attention. And the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid rules dictate, particularly in a nursing home environment that we do that very quickly and we reach resolution. If we cannot reach resolution, that we stop that service and we remove harm from those residents who may be impacted. So, so that's, that's part That's part of my question. Sure that's clear. So that's just part of my question. When you do find a problem um, and then you say, you know, fix it, do they have the resources to fix it effectively that it's at the root of the problem, not just on a Band-Aid level? And, and again, when we get to those situations where it's really, a bad situation, you know, and we need to get corrected. Do they have the resources? Um, you guys are basically um, a surveillance agency to, for this, but this is real problems, right? And and uh, we want the best care for our elderly. We want the best care. And it, do they have the resources to fix those problems, or is it just band aid? And we go to the next person or the next event or the next um, tra um, tra traumatic issue that's going on. Well, in, in relation to nursing homes, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare have to approve our corrective action plans, and they're very stringent in that regard. So if they don't, if they don't meet the standard, then we end up shutting that service down, and we have closed centers who have not met the – we've done that this year during this pandemic, where they did not meet the standard, and we relocate those clients. So there's not a Band-Aid approach. They either have to meet the standard – in an, in an immediate jeopardy situation where there's harm to, to clients or that license is gonna be revoked if they can't meet it within the given time frame, and we end up relocating those clients. So there's thank not a middle ground in that respect. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hood. Uh, very good answers. Um, it appears there are no more questions. I know we have a 3.30 uh, committee meeting. Um, so there being no more questions. Mr. Hood, thank you. Um, we appreciate you and we're dependent on you to continue to protect, again, that most vulnerable population. Thank you for doing that and make sure that everybody knows how much we appreciate their efforts to protect uh, our most vulnerable citizens. I'm sure we'll be uh, speaking with you uh, more fully later this session. Thanks to everyone for being here and uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>